everyone, welcome back to Franchi Talks Asian Art. I'm Franchi and I'm back with a new video. Today's video is part of the Hanafuda series in which we look at these traditional Japanese playing cards. We look at their decorative motifs which usually feature plants and animals and then we look for these motifs in the collection of the Museum of Oriental Art Edoardo Chiusone in Genoa. If you remember from my previous video, a deck of Hanafuda cards is made up of 48 cards divided into 12 suits of 4 cards each. And each suit is connected in its decoration to a month of the year. So in the previous video we started from spring and we saw the suits which are connected to the months of March, April and May. And today we continue this journey, we are going into summer, well it's really it's already really hot where I am and so we're going to look at the cards of the month of June, July and August. Now it doesn't really matter whether you want to see this video first or the previous one in case you missed it, you can start by either video, but the previous video includes a brief introduction to Hanafuda, so if you're curious go check it out. Before we start I just want to drop a brief reminder here that if you enjoy the video and you feel like you're learning something from it, you can consider supporting the channel. You can do this simply by clicking like or subscribing to the channel so you get to see more. And also you can consider sending me a little tip through the website Ko-Fi. But for now, enough with the talking and let's jump right in. Let's start by looking at the cards which are connected to the month of June. We can see that they feature a decoration with peonies, with a cartouche for writing poem called Tanzaku and also butterflies. Let's talk about the peonies first. Peonies are a flower which blooms in summer and they are beloved in East Asia. They were already cultivated since the ancient times in China around the Tang dynasty, so around the 7th and 8th centuries. And these flowers traditionally in China are connected to the ideas of femininity and female eroticism. The flowers were then introduced into Japan a little bit later during the Japanese Heian period, so around the 9th to 10th centuries when they started being cultivated in Japan as well. And the cultivation of peonies continued throughout the centuries and the people who cultivate the peonies every, every season they selected the most beautiful peonies and they arrived to, culti to create very rich, very beautiful Songcho's big flowers. So we went looking for peonies in the collection of the Kyosone Museum and we found this beautiful woodblock print by Utagawa Hiroshige entitled simply Peonies. Hiroshige represents three peonies on this footblock print which has a vertical format and the peonies, well, they span vertically across the print. We can see that they go from the bottom left to the top right. And there are three peonies depicted in this very bright pink color, very lively, very beautiful. And a nice detail to notice is that Hiroshige, he represented these peonies in three different stages of their blooming of their life in a way. We can see that the peony in the middle is bigger, it's more open, so it's like a flower in full bloom, while the peonies at the top and the bottom they're a bit smaller and they're also more closed. They're younger flowers who still have to bloom completely. And at the very top we find a poem. This poem was written by a poet called Kire and I will read it to you. It reads once the water is poured, I will wait a little bit for the moon to rise. And I really love this poem because it gives me the idea uh, that Kire is describing just a simple habit of his that in summer days, as you know when it's really hot and in Japan summer gets really hot, you water your plants in the evening when everything is cooled down a little. And so I imagine that Kire has this habit to go outside and water his peonies in the evening and after he waters them he sees that the sun is gone and the moon is coming up or it's about to come up and so he takes a little moment for himself to, to chill, <laughs> to rest and wait for the 
moon to rise so that you can enjoy the beautiful view. It's a really beautiful and delicate summer image. Let's talk about the card with the Tanzaku briefly. I will talk about this once in the video and then I will not repeat it every time. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it in the previous video as well. When we see a cartouche on the Kanafuda kind, we have to remember that this kind of uh, cards, this kind of papers in this shape were used traditionally in Japan to write poems. And it makes sense that we find it again and again on the suits of the Hanafuda cards because the cards, they, well, they are so deeply connected to the poetic and literary tradition of Japan. And then let's look at the card which features butterflies. Butterflies are also a symbol of femininity in Japan and China. And there is a legend <laughs> in Chinese history, in Chinese culture, which tells us that the sixth, sixth emperor of the Tang dynasty, Xuanzong, he found himself in the imperial palace, in, which is a complex of palaces, and so he freed a butterfly to let the butterfly guide him to the palace, to the actual building in which court ladies resided. And so the combination of peonies and butterflies came to be often found in Japanese arts, and we found it in an, on an object from the collection of the Kyosone Museum. This beautiful set for smoking tobacco bone, dated to the beginning of the 19th century. Tobacco arrived in the Japanese archipelago around the 16th century, introduced by European merchants. However, it took a while for the habit of smoking to become common amongst the Japanese population, but by the 19th century, by the Edo period, it had become a widespread habit. And it was quite common to find in houses and shops a smoking set, which was offered to guests and customers. How the set was made up, let's say materially, physically speaking, could change based on the social class, on the social standing and the wealth of the family or shop who owned it. In general, in the houses or shops owned by the majority of the population, so by the common population, the set was made up of a simple tray on which uh, you could find accessories, objects used for smoking. So, for example, pipes, a brazier, and an ashtray. But in the wealthy families, in wealthy houses, the set could have a very different look. So, more like the objects that we are looking at now, it took the shape of a cabinet. We can see that the, the smoking set of the Kyusone Museum is made up as a proper cabinet made of wood with a, a lac black lacquer decoration. And we can see that it features three drawers and also at its top it includes an ashtray, a brazier and a pipe. As we mentioned, the set was decorated with black lacquer, but the decoration doesn't end here. It's lovishly decorated. We can see that it has been sprinkled with particles of copper powder, which were sprinkled lightly and sparsely. And so it kind of reminds us this effect of the glare of the sun's rays in a summer day. And we can also see that there is a motif of rocks, pennies and butterflies. This motif was made by using gold dust, using a technique called maki e. And so it kind of it gives us the idea, the secretion of a of a garden with these rocks, these peonies and butterflies and the summer rays. It's a kind of outside scene. The decoration features peonies and butterflies, which we mentioned are linked to the idea of femininity. So we can assume that this tobacco bone was actually used by women. It was dedicated to female users. And we have to keep in mind, I talk about this a lot in my videos. If you followed me, if you watched my videos before, you probably heard this. But objects made of lacquer were made by skilled craftsmen. We cannot forget this, we cannot stress this enough. These were craftsmen who used highly specialized skills. 
They used precious materials such as the lacquer itself, gold dust. And we also have to remember that lacquer has to be applied on with several layers. And between each layer, there is a lengthy wait time to make sure that each layer is properly dried up. So making an object such as this can take months, if not years. So understanding the value of these objects can also uh, hint to us or talk to us about the context of use. We can imagine this tobacco bone being used by the women of a wealthy family in a context, for example, of urban life in which it was common in the Edo period to dedicate oneself to moments of carefree pleasure. Let's look at the cards linked to the month of July. On these cards we can see a decoration of L'Espedezza, of a Tanzaku cartouche again, and of a wild boar. Let's talk about the L'Espedezza. Now I have to tell you that this plant is actually... I didn't know it before <laughs> studying Japanese art, but now that I found out about it, whenever I look at objects of Japanese art, I found it so often. This plant in Japanese is called Hagi, and it grows with these supple stems, very long, arched in a way, and it's covered by lots of little green leaves, often dark green, and towards the end of summer it blooms with little purple flowers, the shape of which kind of reminds us of little butterflies, so it's very beautiful, very delicate. This plant, it grows spontaneously, for example, in fields, in the woods, on the sides of paths. And for this reason, it might make us think of a very humble, simple plant. But it's not so humble in the Japanese tradition. In fact, it was always pictured in Japanese art. It was this talked about and mentioned in the Japanese poems, so much so that in the Imperial Gardens in Kyoto there was actually a smaller section of the garden which was cultivated exclusively with L'Espedezza. And if that wasn't enough, we have to also say that this garden was not open to visitors, it was only dedicated to the members of the Imperial Court. And the reasons why the L'Espedezza is so beloved in Japan, it has to do with the flexibility of its branches, which make it so that it can move in the wind very beautifully. And also the little flower, the purple flower of its blooms, they actually bloom towards the end of the summer. So this so they bloom at a time in which many other plants already have no blooms and they bring color in the landscape. That's why it's also so loved. The poet Matsuo Basho dedicated a lot of poems to the, the Spiretta. I will read you one. It reads Without dropping a drop of dew, the Lespedeza dances softly. And so this poem talks about how the Lespedeza moves in the wind, as we mentioned, and compares this movement to a dance. In the collection of the Kyosone Museum, we found a woodblock print, or better, a triptych of woodblock print, which pictures the Lespedeza. It is entitled The Elegant, Excellent Mirror of the Moon, and it was designed by Kikukawa Eizan. The title might seem a little bit confusing, mysterious at first, but let's immediately reveal its meaning. Actually, it describes, it represents this link, this connection between the L'Espedeza and the moon. In fact, traditionally, it was believed in Japan that the L'Espedeza flowered on days with a full moon, well, on nights with a full moon. And in the city of Edo, of Edo for example, a uh, temple Ryugenji was very famous for its uh, L'Espedeza bushes, so much so that it was known as Hagi Dera, the temple of the Hagi. And visitors would go there on the nights of full moon to admire the Hagi in the light of the moon. In this context of admiring the L'Espedeza in the night of full moon, Kikugawa Eizan 
pictures three beautiful women, three city beauties, Beijing, that we have to say are a typical theme of the production of woodblock prints by Kikugawa Eita. And while these three women are all out looking at the huggy plants, so they're all kind of doing the same activity, they're also represented in three different ways, which in a way can also kind of hints to us at their three different personalities. Now we just have to say that this kind of representation of um, multiple women and each of them representing a personality was typical of the Edo period. So we're not looking at this print and stereotyping women or their attitude based on their representation or the activities represented let's say through a modern worldview, but it's more of a thing which was done in the Edo period. For example, we can see on the right a woman who is reading a letter in the moonlight and we can imagine that she must be a very romantic person. I mean, someone who reads letters or poems or writes letters and poems in the moonlight can make us think of something like this. While at the center we see a woman who is returning from the public bath, we can understand that because she is carrying a towel on her shoulders. And also she is wearing a kimono with a very widened neck as if she just put it on quickly just to walk back home. But from how she is walking, kind of looking around, wearing this kimono with a widened neck without making her this, this a problem for herself we can understand that she must be a kind of casual and self-confident woman. While on the left, we see a third woman who is holding a toothpick in her mouth. This is kind of a hint to tell us that she has just finished having dinner. And she seems to be walking to her destination without looking around too much. She seems very focused, so we can imagine that she is a kind of a pragmatic woman who focuses herself on her own activities. Now there is a little thing that we have to talk about that perhaps you noted while I was talking about the Lespedeza and that is that it's depicted on the cards which are linked to the month of July. However, I also mentioned that it blooms at the end of summer and this can seem kind of an incongruence because in this way the Lespedeza becomes a symbol of the end of summer, however, it's represented on the cards of July. And this incongruence is actually due to our problem of calendars. This is because traditionally in Japan the calendar which was used until the end of the 19th century was a lunisolar calendar which had been imported from China and re-elaborated. However, after 1873 the Gregorian calendar was adopted, the calendar as we know it in Europe, North America and I believe this day almost everywhere on the planet. But there were some differences between the lunisolar calendar and the Gregorian calendar because the lunisolar calendar placed the beginning of the year between three and seven weeks after the Gregorian calendar. So we can understand from this that what was considered the seventh month if it started three to seven weeks after the Gregorian calendar actually would have coincided with the month of August. But because with the Gregorian calendar it starts from January 1st, the seventh month ends up being the month of July. So we find this kind of incongruence on when seasons actually start and finish. And so on the Hanafuda cards we actually find another symbol of the beginning of autumn and this is the wild boar. Wild boars, we have to say that this is, for example, in Italy and I believe today, nowadays also in Japan, they are seen as kind of scary, <laughs> reckless animals. But traditionally in Japan they were actually found since the ancient times in the poetical tradition of the archipelago. For example, they are already mentioned in the Kojiki the oldest Japanese written records which was written in the 8th century and they also featured in the poems by Yamabe no Akahito who was also writing in the 8th century. 
and traditional Japanese culture can help us seeing wars under a different lens because they are often seen and represented as a leap or waking up, like getting up from the ground between uh, bushes of l'esperezza. So in this way we can see them as a beautiful, delicate symbol of the autumn season. And in the collection of the Kyosone Museum we found a beautiful uh, Netsuke which is in the shape of a wild boar. Now before we talk uh, in depth, uh, more in depth about the Netsuke, about this Netsuke, I want to talk a little bit in general about Netsuke. I think many of you watching, if you're watching a video of Japanese art, you might already know what they are, but just in case, let's refresh the memory. We have to start from the basics and say that traditionally, Japanese dress did not have pockets. And so it was a common habit, especially among women, to put little objects and to carry them in their sleeves. However, this wasn't always a perfect solution and especially men needed to carry more objects such as pipes, medicine, coins and so on and so the need for containers was developed. And these containers developed, they were called sagemono which means hanging things, hanging objects because they were hung from the belt. And one particular type of sagemono was inro, these little um, wooden containers, wooden boxes decorated with lacquer. The inro were kept close by sliding little beads, which were called ojime, and then they were secured to the belt. The toggle that secured them to the belt was called netsuke. And we have to say that inro, netsuke, ojime, they all were born out of necessity, they were of a very, very utilitarian nature, however with time they developed and they became beautifully crafted objects of great artistic value and expression of extraordinary craftsmanship. So let's go back to our Netsuke from the Kyosone Museum. Netsuke are famous and appreciated for their attention to detail and this Netsuke is not exception. In fact, in fact, we can see how the, the craftsman depicted it in every detail with the fur and its ears pulled back and I especially love the eyes because these are so alive. They seem to be looking, they seem to be focused on something that we cannot see. I like to imagine also because of its dynamic pose we see that it's getting up. I like to imagine that the, that the Bore was meant to be asleep and then something woke him up, maybe a, a noise from another animal in the woods. This noise woke him up and attacked him and now he's getting up, going to check it out. And I have to say I was especially happy with uh, finding with the Kisune Museum this object in their collection because the wild boar is really represented in the same position as the Hanafuda card. It's really a perfect match. Let's now talk about the cards dedicated to the month of August. They feature a decoration of miscanthus, also known as silver grass, of wild geese and a full moon. The miscanthus is called in Japanese Suzuki and it's another plant that I really didn't know before studying Japanese art. And that's how I found out about it. However, I have to say that I fell in love with it after playing Ghost of Tsushima. The developers put their plant everywhere in the video game and I got obsessed with it. The Miscanthus is a herbaceous perennial plant. However, we have to say that it's mostly linked in Japanese culture to the autumn season. Once again, we can see that it's represented on the cards of the month of August, but it's considered an autumnal plant and this is again because of these discrepancies between the Gregorian and the lunisolar calendars. And we find on the cards de dedicated to the month of August another symbol of the autumn season and this is the wild geese. They are connected to the season because in this moment they migrate. They are coming back to Japan 
from the north where they spent the hottest summer months. And we found the wild geese and the miscanthus on a diptych of hanging scrolls kakemono painted by Kano Akinobu. Kano Akinobu was an artist who belonged to the Kano school, one of the major artistic schools in Japan, which was especially dominant between the 15th and the 19th centuries. In fact, at this time, the artists of the Kano school were officially in charge of the production of works of art for the shogunate, the military elite who was in charge of the country. And we can see these two works in a hanging scroll format. We can see that they were actually painted mostly in a monochrome color with shades of black and gray, so monochrome ink, against a very neutral background. This style was actually revived in the previous centuries, in the 17th century, by another artist of the Kano school, Kano Tanyu, and therefore it was adopted by later artists of this Kano school, such as Kano Akinobu. We can see only very few touches of color, for example, in the petals in the lower section of the painting, on the petals of the plants. The scrolls being vertical, we can see how the subjects of the painting spread along this vertical axis. We can see clouds and flying geese at the top, while lower down we can see uh, what we can imagine is a body of water, such as a river, and then on the shores of this body of water we can see autumnal plants, and they're very thin, uh, kind of hard to see, but you can see the miscanthus on the left, and also another plant which we've seen before, which is actually also part of the seven traditional plants of autumn, the Lespidelsa. And I think, all in all, this, two, this diptych is very beautiful, very delicate. It represents perfectly the atmosphere of an autumn day. The miscanthus grows wild, like spontaneously in Japan, and it can cover whole fields. And in the autumn, during autumn, it can move in the breeze, and its movement kind of reminds us of a gesture of saying goodbye, of waving goodbye. And for this reason, it's been attached to feelings of sadness, nostalgia, melancholy, and so it was especially loved by poets and hermits. And in the poetic tradition, the miscanthus is often represented near a full moon. And we can see the full moon, of course, on the Hanafuda cards of the month of August. And we found this combination on a beautiful painted fan belonging to the collection of the Kyosone Museum, dated to the middle of the Edo period. Painted and signed by the another artist belonging to the Kano school, Kano Tansetsu. He was the son of Kano Tanyu, which we mentioned just before, and he inherited his painting style from his father because he learned his painting crafts from his father. However, we also have to say that he developed a very delicate touch in kind of his own style, his own manner, and we can see on, in, on the fan of the Kyusone Museum we can see this signature style of it, this delicate style. In fact, the st stalks of the miscanthus are represented in a very delicate way, as if they were gently swaying in the autumn breeze. The plants are dark green and they have soft white tips and they stand out against the night sky, which is actually left neutral in color. But we can see that they also stand against a full moon in the background, which is positioned at the center of the fan and it's painted in a very bright red color. The uniform background, which we mentioned, was actually a characteristic of the Kano school, which often favored subjects with, with bright colors, which were painted onto a monochrome background, especially often gold. And fans, we have to think that they were essential items traditionally for the Japanese. They fulfilled this practical function of relieving oneself from the heat, practically funding yourself, 
but also they were considered indispensable gifts for celebratory events. And numerous painted fans, countless painted fans, were produced in Japan, decorated with a range of subjects, really becoming small portable works of art. Some of the most important fan painters were, no surprise, the artists of the Kano school. And under the leadership of Kano Motonobu, the Khan even ran a specialized fan painting workshop that produced volumes of painted fans. And the fan of the Kisone Museum actually this is also was also placed in a fan-shaped album, a fan-shaped volume which collected a number of painted fans. And this dedication to creating painting painted fans and fan-shaped volumes really tells us about how this object, which had a practical function, had been elevated into an art form. On this note, with this one last object, I would like to conclude this video. I would like, first of all, to thank the Kyosone Museum for collaborating on this Hanafuda project with me. We worked really hard, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I will link a few contacts to the Kyosone Museum in the description if you are curious to check them out. And I would also like to thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and that you had a good time. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the channel to see more. You can support the channel by clicking like. Feel free to leave a comment with any thoughts, ideas or questions that you may have. And you can consider sending me a little tip to the website Ko-Fi. The link is in the description. But for now, I just want to say thanks and I hope to see you again soon. Bye!